Public meeting come to order today is Tuesday, June 27, 2017. This is the voting meeting of the Prescott City Council. Do you have any introductions? Mayor Pro Tem? Not at this moment. Okay, thank you. Our invocation today will be by Pastor Adam Marquette of Heights Church, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance by Councilwoman Wilcox. Mayor, Vice Mayor, Councilman. Thank you for having me. God's word says this, Psalms 37, verse 3. Trust in the Lord and do what is good. Dwell in the land and live securely. Take delight in the Lord and he will give you your de desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act, making your righteousness shine like the dawn, your justice like the noonday. Be silent before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Lord God, we thank you for being a mighty God. We thank you for being a God of passion, a God who died for relationships, not religion, a, a God who died for us. You had us in mind. And Father, I do pray, first of all, for the fire. I pray that you'll quench the fire. I pray that you'll give the firemen wisdom in uh, uh, shutting down this fire. I pray that you'll keep them safe and those who are in the area of this blaze. I pray, God, that uh, they will shut it down quickly and that uh, father nobody will be injured for it lord i pray for blair this afternoon as he is uh, mourning the loss of his mother i pray god that your holy spirit would just anoint and touch him in a very special way give him comfort that can only come from your holy spirit and lord i pray that as his family goes through this period of tragedy that you would comfort him and uh, all those he loves Father, I thank you for our mayor. I thank you for giving him wisdom and guidance. I thank you, Lord, for his desire to seek justice and uh, do what's fair and to lead uh, as a positive, righteous role model. I thank you for these council men and women. I thank you, Lord, for their willingness to serve you in this capacity. And with it comes great responsibility. And I pray, God, that they will continually be on their hands and knees, uh, Lord, uh, seeking your justice and your wisdom, just as King Solomon did so long ago. Father, I thank you ahead of time for blessing all that they do, bless their families, bless uh, uh, as they sit in the seat of uh, decision-making and leadership. I pray that you give them the guidance that can only come from you. Thank you, Lord, for their service to you and their service to this community. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. 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 Councilman Blair? Yes. Councilman Lazell? Here. Councilwoman Orr? Here. Councilman Shiska? Here. Councilwoman Wilcox? Here. All present. Okay, thank you. I um, want to welcome everybody for taking time out of your day to come in here today. we got quite a bit of uh, work ahead of us, so I think we'll get started. Uh, I'd like to have a couple of announcements first. Um, City Manager, do you have any? I do not. Okay. I'd like to have uh, Chief Light come up and give us a quick rundown on what's happening with the uh, Goodwin fire. Well, first off, good mayor, good afternoon, mayor, members of council. Uh, just wanted to kind of offer a brief update. I've tried to keep you updated as best I could over the weekend uh, by way of electronic means. Uh, this afternoon, the fire has escalated in its size and uh, uh, exposures. And if you don't mind, I'm gonna just read some of the evacuations and pre-evacuation information for the general public. Um, First and foremost, uh, the current mandatory evacuation has been ordered for everything west of Main Street in Mayer. Evacuations are also in effect for the Breezy Pines subdivision as well as for the area north of Goodwin Mayer Road, County Road 177, and west of Highway 69 from Mayer to Poland Junction. This does not include areas east of Highway 69. The evacuation for the community of Pine Flat is still in place and for additional information, the public can contact the Emergency Operations Center for Yavapai County at 928-442-5103 from 0700 to 1900 in the evening. 
In addition, pre-evacuation orders, which means uh, general awareness for the populations concerned in these areas, include the areas of Walker, Potato Patch, Mountain Pines Acres, and Mount Union. Uh, there's a current closure order in place for a very wide swath of the area. I think most of you got that on the map. If uh, Mark could help me here. Oh, hey, imagine that. Mark's pretty good at this. Uh, actually, a little lower here. Just to kind of keep in perspective, Walker is right about just uh, north or just south of that area. Uh, or just north of that at Penn Mark. So uh, to kind of keep that in reference, Walker's about eight miles south. Uh, we do have uh, plenty of resources working the fire. Roughly about 700 to 800 uh, line personnel have been assigned in addition to an incident management team type one, which consists of about 125 members of overhead. Uh, they're set up at Bradshaw High School. Uh, there is a community meeting this evening at 630 down at uh, Bradshaw High School at which time uh, those that are in the direct uh, path may want to make a, a, an accommodation to attend. Uh, we will be representing the city of Prescott there and have additional staff there. With that, if there's any questions, I'll try to entertain those. Question, comments from the council? Real quick. I know you put some dimensions as far as roads, Chief, uh, and you went from 69 to Walker, Old Center Highway, and that. Um, what about White Spar? That is it. Is it? Uh, we're right at the moment. We're we're fairly insulated from that, uh, mind you. Uh, my information is current as of about an hour ago, and when I looked outside, and it's uh, the dynamics of this is very. Uh, uh, just that dynamic okay. uh, so it could change but uh, I think we have enough eyes on the ground to kind of monitor this and uh, right at the moment I don't see an immediate threat to the city of Prescott however uh, some of our neighboring communities uh, with some of the closures we are going to see anticipated uh, expected additional road traffic and uh, with uh, instant manager or instant commander Pearson at the helm I think uh, it's in good hands uh, like the Dosi fire uh, do, is if they have livestock, are we? Are there those people that are willing to bring those in, and we store them at the road? Of course, the rodeo grounds fill right now. Yeah, most of, most of that uh, effort is being undertaken by the Yavapai County folks. Uh, direct city contacts, uh, pretty minimal at this particular time. Okay. My understanding is Highway 69 is closed, and they are routing traffic on Cherry Road. That's correct, right at the moment. Uh, that could be very <laughs> subject to change. Uh, I could walk out of here and it could change. So that's current as of this moment. Any other questions, comments? Okay, thank you, thank Chief. You. Uh, I have one announcement. Um, as you well know, the, um, the uh, State House has set up an ad hoc committee on PSPRS. Their first meeting is in Flag tomorrow, 28th, um, at the uh, Coconino Community College building, starting at 5 o'clock. So if anybody wants to <clears throat> go up and hear about uh, what they're asking the various communities around there, what issue they have with PSPRS, that'll be tomorrow. We'll move on to the consent agenda. I think you had one uh, item you need to uh, provide yes. as correction. Mayor and Council, um, we um, had subsequently did an amended agenda yesterday. It was posted physically on our City Hall bulletin boards at 2.50 p.m. on Monday, June 26th. 2017 due to technical difficulties with our Acela program it did not get posted on the city website until 3 20 p.m. and the item that was added was item 9h okay we'll move on to the consent agenda item 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 a assigned Virginia Mefford as interim city clerk through July 18th 2017 B, approval of city contract number 2017-360 with Prescott Newspaper, Inc. for annual legal advertising services in estimated amount of $14,500. Approval to accept grant from the Arizona State Library through the Library Services and Technology Act in the amount of $38,530. There is no matching funds required. Adopt resolution number 4389-1598 between the City of Prescott and Prescott Historical Society, Inc. to ap approve city contract number 2017-352 in the amount not to exceed the amount of $10,000 per fiscal year. 
adopt resolution number 4392-1601, amending the development agreement for Stormwatch subdivision, ex extending the agreement until July 10th, 2018. Item F, approval of the final plat for Stormwatch subdivision. G, approval amendment number one to the intergovernment agreement. City contract number 2010-137 between the City of Prescott and the Prescott Unified School District. Item H, contract for services with Marina Cool and of Cool Enterprises LLC for research and preparation of a housing demand study. City contract number 2017-361, not to exceed $13,000. Approval of, ex of employment contract with city attorney contracts City of Contract Number 2017-364. Item J, Award of City Contract Number 2018-001, approving a supply contract for 65-gallon residential containers from Odo <coughs> Environmental using Houston Galveston Area Council. Contract pricing in an estimated annual amount of $130,000. Approval of Amendment Number 2 to City Contract 2015-2029A2 with Charlie Pepper Incorporated for the purchase of course saw in the amount not to exceed 23000 per year. Okay, I've been asked by uh, Councilwoman Wilcox to pull item F for further discussion. Is there any other item that the council wants to pull for further discussion? Okay, do I have a motion? May I recommend to approve cons consent agenda items 9A through 9K second. without F. Second. Okay, I have a motion, second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Councilwoman Wilcox. Thank you, Mayor. Um, uh, there are five members of this council who have not seen the preliminary plat or this subdivision, which was done about 10 years ago. And we were not given all the information or background on this subdivision. We got a minimal amount of information Thursday evening when the council packets were issued. And it just raised an awful lot of questions in my mind. I think it would have been much better if the uh, developers, applicants, had a work study session with the full council to inform us of what this subdivision is about, what the discussions with staff have been regarding trail connectivity, uh, what the road issues are. I, I just, uh, I don't think we can responsibly vote on approving a final plat when we don't have enough information. So I would like to defer this item until such time as we can uh, meet as a council and get some more information from staff. Any other questions, comments from the council? I would agree. As somebody that did see that flat, I, I think that uh, it's been some time since, and the other five have not, and I think there does need to be a study session on it. Is there anyone here representing Storm Ranch subdivision? He was step on up and. Mayor and Council Charlie Arnold with Land Corps Development Group. Um, Councilman, Councilwoman Wilcox, just to um, follow up, this was approved approximately 10 years ago uh, by the council at the time. And through the last eight months, our group has been in the process of acquiring uh, this project, working with staff both in community development as well as engineering in order to meet the deadline imposed by the original development agreement and the amendment to that agreement to have the final plat done by July 10th of this year. Um, recently, within the last four months, this council voted to approve the extension of the water service agreement for one year. You all just voted to approve a one-year extension to the development agreement. As far as the plat goes, um, and as staff has found, we're in substantial conformance with the preliminary plat. We've met all the statutory requirements that we need to. As far as the questions about trail connectivity, uh, the original preliminary plat 
has always contemplated a trail system being included in this project. We have, since the very beginning of our discussions with staff, been very supportive of following through in that direction. We've met on site with the trails and park staff to actually look at alignments. We've discussed crossings in the 404 areas and where the roads are. We've discussed connectivity to the neighboring parcels. We've also discussed potentially putting a parking lot on our open space instead of into the state land uh, so that it's not something that gets invested into and then eventually could be developed by somebody else. We would actually have a parking lot on our site that benefits the entire region as far as the trail system goes. So again, through these last several months, we've been working to make sure that the plat is in conformance. We've addressed a lot of the outstanding issues and we've been following the development agreement that was previously approved and that's encumbered the property since then. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Go ahead. Well, all that sounds great, but it needs to be in writing, either on the flat or in the development agreement. So my understanding is, and my recollection, the plat specifically references that we will have trail systems and that those alignments are going to be decided in conjunction with city staff and the ownership of the property. And our discussions with staff specifically have revolved around looking at timing, when we're going to be constructing roads, bringing in staff to look at alignments, where we're going to put the trail in conjunction with the road, with the drainage. Because of the 404 permit, we're very limited in certain areas as to what we can disturb. So we've made accommodations in our design to make sure that those trail improvements aren't impacting the 404 areas on the site. Councilman Shiska. Thanks, Mayor. You know, Gene, I think that, that on one level, I, I totally agree with you that, you know, I would like to see a presentation on this. On another level, it says here that staff reviews of the plans and plat are complete when the staff has determined that the final plat is in substantial conformance with the preliminary plat. So, on one hand, I, I, I can see that. I would like to see a presentation. On the other hand, I'm sitting there going, you know, staff has gone over and over and over and over on this. And if they are feeling that it's in substantial conformance with the original plat, then I, I, I have a hard time saying, let's not go ahead and do this. Um, well stated. And if I may, there's some conditions with this approval, as an example, the archeological mediation plan um, prior to recordation of the plat. And I think that we certainly would be comfortable in working with staff and bringing back our trails presentation prior to the plat itself being recorded. City Attorney, um, why don't you weigh in on this? What, what kind of time limits are we working with? Um, well, the the standard is, is as Councilman Shishka has stated, you know, substantial compliance. So, uh, you know, even if there were a presentation, um, there's you, council has very little discretion at this point because the final plat is in substantial compliance as, as determined by the staff, and that's the normal course of action. Uh, should the council decide to um, continue this out until I guess it would be July 11 which would be our next council date it's one day post what the development agreement requires for final plat approval so what you would what I would recommend you do is you would affirmatively vote to waive that requirement for a July 10 um, final plat approval and have the presentation and perhaps the, you know at study session on the 11th if this if the council wants to do a presentation with a vote immediately following at the voting session on the 11th and you could you could waive the the July 10 requirement if if that's the majority will of the council but I recommend you do that by a motion and vote along with the continuance of this item to that July 11 day yeah. council open or uh, yes mr. mayor um, I'd like to move ahead with this. You know, we just spoke in our last study session about how it is that we want to provide service <laughs> to people who are here 
and um, I, I don't really see the reason to hold back on this for a presentation to council if they have met the standard and they've gone through staff and we're talking on one hand about let's make sure that that we provide customer service and we we expedite and, and work with our business people and then here we're saying no let's let's not do that let's hold things up I don't see I don't see a reason to hold things up I guess I would say Jean so I, w I would vote that we go ahead and approve this Councilman Lizelle thank you mayor uh, I couldn't I, I agree with you uh, Billy and Gene, I, I'm with Steve with you, both one and the other. But this is not like it snuck up on us. It's been in the works in the hopper for 10 years. You guys have done your due diligence. And uh, there's a lot of people waiting with their nail bags on, ready to go to work. So I'm, I'm saying let's vote on this. Because open door, I'm correct your Wilcox. Well, a lot of things have changed in 10 years. And this development is going to impact a lot of people, not the least of which is a visual impact. And I think that really it should go back through planning and zoning and a public process so the community can weigh in on it again. I know that's an exhausting effort. <laughs> I'm sorry, Charlie, but um, it's, it's, uh, you're so close to the deadline, it's, it's stale information. And I just don't think it is responsible for any one of us to vote on something when we don't have all the information before us. That's the thing that bothers me. It would have been so easy to schedule something two weeks ago with the council to go over this development and, and get some, some input. And if there were a serious problem, we could discuss it and you could take care of it. But right now, I just can't vote. Councilman Shishka. Thank you. So we're not just talking about a presentation. We're talking about going through the P&Z process again. I mean, you know, what Billy was talking about is that, that you know, if this had, if, if the staff had reservations about this situation, I could, I could imagine, you know, the concept of going through all this but I just can't imagine the staff which is as competent as it is approving this with com com substantial compliance and and us just going ah, forget it we're you know we don't believe you guys we're heading in our own direction so I too would would like to move this forward uh, if I wouldn't have seen that I would have said, yeah, maybe we need to do this. It's been 10 years. But I just think that, that we need to trust our staff and uh, move forward. And Charlie, I think you said something about before you record this thing, you would work with us to make sure that we have, you know, some of these other concerns looked at. Absolutely. Specifically with the trails, um, that's something that I think, depending on staff's availability, uh, that we could meet and get into more detail on. I mean, our last meeting was pretty detailed, talking about, well, should we be on that ridge line or should we be on that slope there? But I think we could get to an exhibit to bring back to council so that you all are <coughs> aware of the trail plan for this project. City Attorney, is that okay? Yeah, Mayor, there, you know, I, I would, I'm, or do you think this is necessary? N you know, to the, no, certainly um, going through that process for trails and there are a couple of condition, conditional items that staff has and those things need to be taken care of. Um, I, I just don't know, I don't have any factual basis to be able to, to say you can force this developer to go back through the, the, the approval process. Um, the development agreement provides, it's kind of one of the reasons developers enter into development agreements to sort of freeze, you know, the approvals in time, the subdivision plat. The preliminary approval never expired, so it's not as if it was an expired approval that had a certain time frame. I, I just, I, I don't know, and, and I'll defer to the queue, they're shaking their heads. Now, there's no factual basis 
to require this developer to go back through. So even if you did a presentation, it doesn't change your limited discretion, very limited discretion as to whether to approve the final plat or not. And that's the question of whether it's a substantial conformance with the preliminary plat and staff report says it is. So they have, there are a couple of items that need to be dealt with. And, if the, and, and if certainly if the developer is willing to come back and talk about you know, details of, of trails and things, you know, I'd say take it, um, you know, and, and agree that they'll, they'll come back and do that. Whether I don't, as if it was public or with staff or if there's a presentation to council on that, certainly that, you know, they could, you could, you could ask the developer to come back and do that at a study session, talk about trails and get public input on trails. I, I mean, there's, they, they can say no, but I don't expect that they would. Okay, Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, John. <clears throat> It is in substantial conformance with the. Yes. Right. Who sets the standard for substantial conformance? Substan you know, this, the statute talks about the, the zoning. Statute. St statute talks about what substantial conformance is, and, and I'll defer to community development. Um, you know, it, it doesn't, it, there's always <coughs> going to be slight adjustments um, to lot lines and roadways and between preliminary and final. That's sort of typical. Normally, um, you, you, you know, you don't go up in the number of lots, or at least, you know, maybe one or two, depending on the size of the development. If you're going down, that's generally considered in the, even by fifth, 10 or five, you know, 10% or something. That's always, that's generally considered in substantial conformance. Meaning, is, is, does this preliminary plat, or I mean, I'm sorry, does this final plat basically look like the preliminary plat that was approved 10 years ago? And that's what, community development staff are shaking their head yes I guess the point I was trying to get to it's it's not the statute of the city of Prescott no, it's the state law it's a state law all right so I just heard my attorney tell me I have limited discretion based by state law this meets all the requirements of the state law I, I, right? I would, again I defer to, to develop community development staff if they're saying it's a substantial conformance unless you find a basis to disagree you know, if, if you see something in this plat that says it's not, otherwise I think, you know, I'd recommend going with the, the uh, advice of your staff. Thank you. Councilwoman Wilcox. Oh, well, we've been given virtually no opportunity to see the difference between the preliminary plat and the final plat. I'm just a person who likes to read agreements. I never, I got a copy of the development agreement this morning, and I didn't have time to read it because we were at meetings. I tried reading it for 20 minutes over lunch, and it's that thick. So I don't know what I'm doing here. Well, again, you know, it's, it's um, I, I just defer, if community development staff, in their opinion, you know, says it's in substantial conformance, I guess it's your choice or not to believe them or agree with them or disagree with them. But I mean, that's, that's generally speaking, the standard by which you apply is it does the, does the professional staff believe that it's in substantial compliance or conformance with the preliminary plat? And they're saying yes. They're not saying anything, they're just nodding their heads like this. <laughs> so. We're elected to make the decision. I understand. Not the staff. Well, again, and, and let me make it clear, there are decisions that council makes when it comes to approving things. Final plat approval is, is, is not a discretionary approval. It's essentially ministerial if, if it meets the standard of substantial conformance or compliance with the preliminary plat. And that, so it's a very, it's a, like I said, a very limited discretion. Yeah. Mayor, can I make a motion? You can make a motion. Um, I move to approve final plat FP17-002 for Storm Ranch subdivision subject to the satisfactory completion of the outstanding items identified in the staff report. Second. second. I have a motion second vote, please. Gene <laughs> um, Wilcox dissenting and all the rest approved. Okay, thank you. We'll move on to item eight, liquor license agenda. Okay. Item eight. I do have a 
script. Where is it? I have a script that I want to read you guys. Where we go? Uh, Mayor and Council, there is one new license application on today's liquor license agenda. It is for a Series 10 beer and wine store liquor license from Ankit S. Patel, applicant for Chevron Prescott, located at 2889 Willow Creek Road. The application has been determined to be in compliance with city requirements and being recommended for approval. AK is present to answer any questions you may have. Is the applicant here? Come on down. Afternoon. Tell us a little bit about your request. Uh, it's just a transfer from an existing one, so it's already there. Okay. Yeah. So it is a transfer? Um, it's, a, it's called a person to person transfer, is that right? No, this nope. was a new, it was no, marked no, new application. Look. Okay, so but there is already one existing, so I guess we couldn't do person to person, so we just applied a new one. Because B is a person to person transfer. It's th yes. something That's totally correct. different. You were yes. on uh, A, Mr. Mayor. Mayor, on um, the Chevron Prescott, on the application that the state sent over to us, it had new application marked on there. So, so what, what could have a, a, a Series 10 um, beer and wine store license is a, is a marketable commodity. So I, I'm, I'm just guessing if the. If the, cur the former or the owner of that 10 could have either moved it or sold it to somewhere else in Yavapai County. So I think his point is, is there was an old, this isn't technically a person to person, it's re but it's replacing one of 10 that was there with a new 10 okay. now existing yeah, pretty one. Much, so yeah. it's yeah. not technically, my mistake, not technically person to person, but essentially the, the, uh, the equivalent of that. Yep. Okay. So is everybody else on the council clear of this if I'm not? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> There's mud. <Yeah>. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thanks. Mayor, I'd like to. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, go. Is there any uh, comments from the public on this application? Okay. I'll entertain a motion. Mayor, I move to close the public hearing. Second. Second. I have a motion, second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Mayor, I move to approve uh, the recommendation of liquor license application number 10133314 for a series 10 beer and wine store liquor license for Chevron Prescott located at 2889 Willow Creek. Second. second. Have a motion and second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Item B. Item B, there are um, two person-to-person -person transfers on today's agenda. The first one is a, for a Series 6 bar from Joshua McCreer, applicant for Whiskey R, LLC, doing business as Jersey Lily Saloon, located at 116 South Montezuma <coughs> Street. The application has been determined to be compliant with the city requirements and being recommended for approval. Susan Roberts or Andre DeFretis here today, they were the ones that were supposed to be present to do speak about it okay come on up please so I've already been down to Jersey Lily and, and, <laughs> and had a drink so I was on did you already have a license <laughs> yes <laughs> well, that's a good, good I'm glad to hear that. Is a legit person to person <laughs> hey, congratulations thank you yeah <laughs> That was a great place. Thank so, you. Um, do, you, do you have anything you want to offer? Or? We just look forward to doing business. Okay. Thank you for investing your money in Prescott. Thank you. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Any uh, comments from the public on this uh, transfer? Do you have a motion? Mayor, I move to close the public hearing. Second. Have a motion and a second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Do you have a second motion? Mayor, I move to approve 
uh, liquor license application number 06130076 for a <clears throat> person to person transfer for s <clears throat> series six bar liquor license for Whiskey Row RLLC DBA Jersey Lily Saloon located at 116 South Montezuma Street. Second. I have a motion to second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Okay. Item two. The second one we have today is for Series 6 bar from Guillermo Aldaca, Aldaco for Los Pinos Mexican Food LLC. The applicant has been determined to be in compliance with the city requirements and being recommended for approval. Is Guillermo here today? Um, he's the one that's going to be presenting on this. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi. Um, where's your... Um, the old I guess cone. it's a uh, basket restaurant? Yes, it's going Where, to the old where's pine Where's it located? Cone. Pardon? We're going into the old pine cone. Okay. Oh, yes. ah, great. Okay. Yes. All right. Any questions from the council? Is this going to be traditional Mexican, uh, gourmet Mexican? What What are we looking at? It's going to be good. Uh, <laughs> uh, That's what we need. Uh, it's good uh, Mexican. <laughs> we're uh, doing a lot of work to the place and trying to get it ready and have it a little bit of upper scale. All right. Nice. Good, guac, yes. good Cadillac margaritas. Yes. Yeah. Nice. We have a business in Chino Valley called Casa Grande and oh. yeah, do pretty good there. Okay, great. great. So you're not going to have ballroom dancing there? Once in a while. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks for bringing the business here. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Any questions? Any concerns? No, that's it, I think. Thank you. Thank you. Any uh, public uh, comment on this particular transfer? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Got some thumbs up. I guess they like Mexican food. Okay, great. <laughs> Do you have a motion? Mayor, I move to close the public hearing. Second. Got a motion, second vote, please. Passes unanimously. And uh, I move to approve liquor license application number 06130047 for a person to person and location transfer for a Series 6 bar liquor license for Los Pinos Mexican Food LLC, location 1245 White Spar Road. Second. I have a motion to second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Move on to item C. Uh, we have one special event, and it was for um, Stand for Prescott. The application has been determined to be in compliance with city requirements and is being recommended for approval. If you have any questions, let me know, and I can try and answer them for you. Okay. Any questions, comments from the council? I, be I believe, uh, City Attorney, there's, uh, is it the... Um, Applicant that has can only have so many. It's a location, Mayor. So it's the location, this location yeah. being the courtyard, Holiday the 150 Green. South Montezuma is allowed 12 per calendar year, um, and I believe that this is they're they're under 12 at right. this point. For so when, once they hit 12, they're they're capped out for the calendar year. Okay, and good. I believe they only have like about six right now. So okay. All right, do I have a motion? Mayor, I move to recommend. I'm sorry, go ahead, Billy. No, this that's you. Yeah. That's no, okay. this is all you. Yeah, Billy, Billy go ahead. <laughs> I will do it. Here we go. <laughs> move to forward special event liquor license applications 10A1 and 10A2 to the Arizona State Liquor Board with recommend recommendation of approval. Second. Can I have a motion and second vote, please? Passes unanimously. Okay, regular agenda. On item A, it's approval of the site plan SI 17-003 and waste service agreement 15-011, city contract number 2017-362 for Crown Point Apartments Condominiums, a 102 dwelling unit multifamily complex located at 609 Bagby Drive. Mayor and Council. This is a request for approval of a site plan that is associated with a water service agreement. And as you recall, your current year water policy requires the site plan to accompany a water service agreement so that we have a review of the design of the proposed development 
to make sure that our Planning Commission has a review of it. We're looking for something that makes it a practical design, something that can actually come to fruition at some point during the process. The process was set up in order to have this go before our Planning Commission, and it did on two separate occasions. Uh, Planning Commission took a review of it, uh, found a couple of questions relating specifically to um, the topography of the site as it runs north to south. So this is Montezuma, just uh, off of the edge of the map here. Bagby Lane is right up here, and the access is via Bagby Lane. And at the bottom down here is Vallejo Drive, that is a, a, a southern access into the site. The concern um, of the Planning Commission during the original <coughs> review was in the steepness of this driveway. This runs the full length of the site, and it runs from um, middle to high ground here, up to a high point about here, and then downhill the rest of the way all the way to the Vallejo. So the Planning Commission asked for the additional information of um, topography on the site, which is what this particular drawing shows, as well as an explanation of, of how the, the site will be maintained uh, so that in winter months, because again, this is a south facing, um, that that area will be um, safe for traffic internally for both the residents of the site and for our fire police services should they have to <laughs> access the site. Um, the applicants came back to our planning commission for the second time at that second meeting. Uh, while still um, some concern remained about, again, ice and snow on the site, uh, our planning commission uh, voted five to zero in favor of making that recommendation to you that this uh, site plan is uh, in fact a viable site plan and could be developed and therefore um, meets the requirement of your water policy to accompany the water service agreement that's before you today. If you have any questions whatsoever, I'd be happy to answer and I believe we have a representative of the developer here as well. Um, I will point out it's 102 residential dwelling units uh, initially as an apartment complex, but with the potential of becoming a condominium complex, which requires a subdivision plat at some point in the future. Should they choose that route, it does not affect the water because the water is set up by multifamily and single family. Condominium is still a multifamily. It would require subdivision plat come back to this council at some point for a final approval uh, should they choose that route. If you have Council any other questions. Councilman Blair. <coughs> George, can you share with me the ingress egress spots on that map? So again, Bagby Lane is just off of the drawing to the north, comes in this way. So you have main access here. And then at the south, the access is off of Vallejo into the site. So there's two primary points of access on public streets. Uh, one at the top end and one at the bottom end. The top end, the higher end being the north and the lower one being uh, the south end. Is there a requirement for multifamily to have a landscape plan associated with it? Yes. So yeah. they will have to submit a landscape plan along with their building permitting. Thank you very much. Any other questions or comments? Councilwoman Wilcox. Um, how were the um Concerns of the Planning and Zoning Commission resolved regarding the steepness of the driveway. Try to zoom in just a little bit and point these out. So as you enter the parking lot at the north, the developer, the architect in, who designed it, has this as a level parking lot. Then there's a, a decline from here to here, I'm sorry, an incline from here to here. Then the entrance into this parking lot is a flat area. So the driveway comes in, it flattens out, and then it goes down again beyond that. He's created a flat spot that would allow for emergency vehicles to make turns and to make uh, stopping movements um, at each of those points where you can make a turn east or west into the site. So there's a space there that allows for that access. The Planning Commission also discussed that the majority of this driveway, because it's a south-facing um, slope, will be exposed to sun early throughout the day. It's an east um, and south-facing slope. Um, that area will likely have uh, the quickest amount of melt to occur during the day because it will occur early and you'll have sun the longer part of the day. Um, but the primary thing to um, alleviate their concerns were the flat spots at each of these driveway entrances. And again, 
um, all the way through the site that way. What about storm drainage? Is that discussed? No, that will be designed and submitted to us as part of a building set. Okay. And uh, how about traffic, generation of traffic, and will this be going through a residential neighborhood? The, the main entrance to the north is not a residential neighborhood. It's commercial in that first block. Uh, the south entrance is a residential neighborhood. It's primarily multi- and single-family homes in the area. Um, our traffic engineer has looked at the site. There will be some requirement for uh, a traffic um, review of the street and the access up here because there are some potential um, points where there could be um, congestion uh, at, that, at that point. Um, some change to the driveway aspect may be necessary. That is typical of a apartment complex this size. It's also typical of our process to have the traffic engineer involved early at this stage, even though no building plans have been developed yet. Okay. Any other questions, comments from the council? Any from the public? Do I have a motion? May I move to approve S slash one seven dash zero zero three. Second. I have a motion and second vote, please. <coughs> Passes unanimously. Do we have a second motion? Move to approve WSA fifteen dash zero one one city contract number two zero one seven dash three six two. Second. second. Motion and second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Move on to item B. Approval of Site Plan 17-001, Water Service Agreement 17-006, City Contract Number 2017-363 for Pine Haven Apartments, a 42-unit complex. Thank you, Mayor and Council. This is the same concept as we just talked about, a Site Plan Approval for um, in association with Water Service Agreement. Um, this one's a little bit different for several reasons. Um, one, it is south side of town, so it is accessed off of White's Bar, which is down here. White's Bar um, is a state road, uh, under state route under control of ADOT uh, for placement and design of intersections and driveway entrances. So the developer will have to work his way through um, an ADOT review as part of his submittal, um, and that review will be um, need to be completed before we issue building permits on the site. The site was originally occupied for residential purposes. It was a manufactured home park um, there for years. Um, that manufactured home park actually had a groundwater, um, I won't call it an allocation, a groundwater determination made for it. Uh, the requested 42 units that are proposed um, as part of this development actually accounts for less water than the groundwater allocations. So while we have to account for the amount of groundwater through a water service agreement, no water is actually coming out of your all water account for this purpose. This was reviewed by our planning commission as well. Um, some questions were asked uh, regarding this building, which very slightly encroaches into the setback at this point. Um, that is a very minor adjustment that can either be done through administrative adjustment or by slightly canting the building, which will bring it out of the setback. So it's a less than two foot encroachment. Um, Planning Commission did note that the developer or designer thought ahead to provide a turnaround here for uh, both uh, used by fire department and or by our sanitation folks in accessing the site. So they recommended uh, unanimously in favor of um, approving this site plan as well. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer. And property owner or developer is here. Any questions, comments from the council? Apparently, everybody's pretty happy. <laughs> then I'm happy. Okay, good. <laughs> thank you for your consideration. No questions? Apparently not. No, thank you. Thanks, George. Any from the public? Hi, my name is Dottie Morris, and I live in Cathedral Pines, and we're all smelling some smoke, and I smelled it very strongly during the fire, the Indian fire. Uh, my concern right now is that the only entrance and exit from this plan 
is onto the state highway. It go crosses a bridge, which the state made only two lanes, either direction. Hazley enters that. You'll notice that the only way to get out of Cathedral Pines at this point, with 100, about approximately 110 lots and numbers of houses, is down Peterson Lane, diagonally across the bridge and across Granite Creek. It's still narrow. If there is a fire, there, that is the only way to get out of our neighborhood. Mountain Club has closed off our only other way or to enter against the National Forest at Jack Pine. So I'm quite concerned at 42. Also, I'm concerned about the water usage because according to the uh, courier, there's an increase, a request to increase to uh, 10, I guess it's uh, acre acre inches or feet rather than what it was set at seven or approximately seven and I can't understand why we would uh, not limit the amount of water being used there as well as the plan itself with one, only one entrance and exit I would assume with eight, with 42 units there could be approximately 84 cars if there is an emergency of any kind we have a problem not only that trying to get out of Peterson Lane with the number of houses up on Cuny Hill in Cathedral Pines can be a real challenge trying to make a left turn right on the other side of the bridge with an, a development with people trying to get out also on the state highway. So those are my major concerns in that development. I think it's an odd shape. It limits the way to get in and out because of the bridge right there. And I think the council should consider that when looking at the plat as well as the water use. Thank you very much. Thank you. George, do you want to comment on that? The, um, the water service agreement um, reflects 5.04 acre feet use for the site based on the 42 units. The original use was estimated or calculated, excuse me, at 7.5 acre feet. So this development will use less water based on, and again, this is, this is also using your new water policies approach to uh, water conservation for multifamily. We'll actually use less water than the original development that was there, the manufactured home park. The access on and off of the roadway is something that is of some concern. Um, ADOT will take a look at it as part of their design for the driveway access. George, can you point where that, point that out? Where the bridge is she's talking about and, and there's a there's a bridge right here. And this access comes out just to the south of that bridge. This is the roadway she was talking about making access out of Cathedral Pines. So there is an offset intersection um, right at that location. The, the <coughs> offset is, is about 40 feet of offset. It's not, um, it's not something we would normally encourage, but there's no alternative access to either site. They're pretty much a fixed points at this time. Um, the concern is going to be whether or not 42 additional units with the amount of traffic that's generated by multifamily residential would actually have an impact on the volume of traffic on Whites Bar at that point. Um, our traffic engineer doesn't believe that will occur. He doesn't believe that will be an impact, but it will be a, a discussion with ADOT that's necessary on the developer's part in order to get that approved. So the, we're just dealing with the water service or approving the water service agreement, right? That's correct. So today? The, the site plan approval and review by the Planning Commission is to let you know that this project it makes sense to the point where it's worth giving a water service agreement to. And that's, that's your policy, your water um, allocation policy for this year has us do that in order for you not to I hate to use the term waste, but apply water to a development that may not have practical aspects or may have some kind of major um, condition that would impede it being developed in the future. Uh, you've had that happen in the past. You have not had that happen since we started this process. Planning Commission has reviewed these things from a practical standpoint and made recommendations to you in each case this year. So basically the, um, the traffic situation be looked at by ADOT? Yes, sir. Okay. And will they do that in the near future? I don't know. Before the developer can pull building permits, he will have to have that conversation and resolve that issue. 
You want to comment? Well, I had a meeting with ADOT, and they, they're requesting a traffic study be done as part of the permit process. I also want to let you know that I was a mobile home park with 27 units in there, three bedroom units, and I'm going to 42 two bedrooms. So I'm not, I'm really close in numbers there as far as the amount of sleeping bedroom units on that site. So I think we're increasing by three or something. I can't remember now. So it's not a huge increase over what was there before as far as the amount of bedrooms. Now, you know, obviously not everybody in a bed, uh, bedroom drives, and I understand their concerns with additional cars but uh, like I said a dots required the traffic study be done and my engineer is going to do it and it'll be part of the permit process okay Councilman Mozell do you want to say something no I, I just um, use my two eyes and answer my own question okay. all right any other uh, public comment I'm Daniel Matson, Little Merritt. Um, I had occasion to enter and exit that place while it was at a uh, trailer park. Uh, I believe he's paving the street, the road, so that'll fix some of the problem we had with it. it I mean, it's not the most graceful looking entrance and exit, but I never had any problems at all. Uh, it, I think it's just fine. I, I really don't think we're gonna have any problem with it at all, and I, I think it's a considerable upgrade from what it was. And uh, yes, a lot of people I knew and helped uh, lived in that park, and I think uh, this guy's a good citizen. We should uh, approve it. Okay, thanks. Any other comments? All right, do I have a motion? Mayor, without trying to redesign the man's project, I move to approve site plan SI 17-001 and water service agreement 17-006. City contract number 2017-363. Second. A motion a second, vote please. Lizelle. What can I do? It passes unanimously. Nice. Next item. Um, that'll be item C. C, adoption of city ordinance number 503. 37-1577 authorizing the sale of surplus city property known as the Old South Reservoir to Warren C. Cools in the amount of $100,000 with buyer responsible to pay any and all closing escrow costs. Afternoon, Council. I'm there. Um, Period direct discussions that we've had uh, starting this spring on uh, selling excess city property. Uh, we advertised this particular property for uh, three consecutive weeks in the Courier newspaper. Uh, we put it out for bid and opened up their bids and uh, Mr. Cool had the highest uh, bid. He was actually the only bidder on this particular property as it is very unique. It was the old uh, original South Reservoir. Um, we acquired it in uh, 1883 from Mr. Bashford from the Bashford Courts. Uh, back then for the water, water was originally brought from all the way from uh, Chino Valley to that site and that's where the water was stored for the city of Prescott for many, many, many years. Uh, about 10 years ago, we built the new site, which is off to the right. If you look at the drawing there, you can kind of see where some area was disturbed and we built a new site actually in the ground. So it's uh, you don't even see it if you're really looking for it. Um, we put this property up for sale for $100,000 and that was Mr. Cool's bid of $100,000 and it's gonna be cash sale. Um, and it's pretty straightforward as far as, as far as that goes. And he's here if you had any questions for him also. Mayor Pro Tim, you got a question? Thank you very much. Is it my understanding that the proceeds from sale of excess property goes into the bucket for helping pay off PSPRS? Well, it, I'm, I, that, that would be a discussion for Yes. <laughs> thank, thank you. Thank you for inter, inter, interjecting. <laughs> if it's, if it's, this is a water site, so I don't think this one could specifically go. However, if we if we acquired the property in 1893, it, 1883, I we didn't have a water enterprise okay. fund. Yeah. So I, I can, we can have a conversation with Mark Woodfill later um, to determine whether or not. I mean. It, it may, it may come down to whether we've invested, you know, water enterprise money into the property, that it, that it's entitled to reimbursement. But we could certainly look at that issue if the council approves the sale, to see 
you well, know, all are part of it can go into I, the I'd fund. appreciate yeah. that because as we've sat here and wrestled with this whole issue of paying up the pension fund as quickly as possible, 100 here, 100 there, pretty soon it adds up pretty quick. So if there's liberty as to how we look at this, I would, I would like to we go do, that way. We can do that. I just like to say thank you, Warren, for being a local guy and investing back into the community. Any other questions, comments from the council? <clears throat> Any from the public? Do you have a motion? Mayor, I move to adopt ordinance 5037-1577. Second. second. Have a motion and second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Item D. Okay, item D. Award of city contract number 2017-311 to Schofield Civil Construction LLC for the Zone 12 Interconnect Pump Station project in the amount of $1,003,000. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council. My name is Steve Oroz of Public Works. Uh, the item before you today is a water system improvement uh, project for a new pump station uh, located at the tip of that uh, blue dot right about there. Uh, this pump station will provide supplemental and redundant uh, system capacity uh, while improving our production capabilities between the uh, production zones to the north and east, to the city, to the south and west. Uh, we um, publicly bid this project for two consecutive weeks in April and May of this year, held a mandatory pre-bid meeting with multiple uh, general contractors. On May 25th, we had two bids, and uh, we're recommending uh, that Schofield Construction be awarded the uh, bid for the project. If there's any other questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Councilman Lizelle. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Steve. Obviously, you, you said there was two people that bid this, yes. and your uh, department came up to a 1.1 million estimate on the on the on the bid. Yes. Now, um, the the person that's gonna we're gonna award this to, they are the lowest. But are they gonna come back with us or change orders, or are we protected with that, or we are protected with our contract, our bid specifications. Uh, there were no questions uh, that were generated. Uh, uh, this project does have a several uh, large uh, lead time or large uh, valves that are involved. The estimates that we may have gotten from the manufacturers may have been uh, high and that the successful contractor was able to negotiate a better price in the valves. So this uh, slight uh, uh, underestimate uh, bid is not concerning to us. Okay, thank That's you. Uh, Councilman Blair. Question, how, how big is that piece of property there on the corner? Uh, it's actually county right-of-way. It's in the county right-of-way? Yes. Um, excuse me. The, the uh, county right-of-way is roughly along the north edge of the uh, Pinion Oaks neighborhood. Uh, this is an undeveloped parcel in this area. We have an easement that flows from the street here to the county right-of-way and we've uh, worked with the county to uh, have an easement to uh, put the pump station in the right roadway road right of way. Okay. Any other questions, comments from the council? Any from the public? Do I have a motion? Mayor, I, I move we award city contract number 2017-311 to Schofield Civil Construction, LLC, for the Zone 12 Interconnect Pump Station project in the amount of $1,003,000. Second. Motion and second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Yeah. Next item. Yeah. Item E, award of contract number 2017-353 to RFI Consultants, LLC, for special inspection services for the Chino 5MG tank project in the amount of 47500 Thank you, Mr. Mayor, um, uh, clerk, and council. My name is Steve Oros, still. Uh, this is for a, uh, a special inspection that's related to the Chino tank project that uh, you awarded on May 9th. 
Uh, occasionally we have certain inspections on tanks when they're either constructed or uh, rehabilitated that require a special certification called NACE. Uh, I don't remember what the acronym stands for, but it's a, a nationally certified uh, special inspector for uh, uh, potable water tanks. And uh, with this Chino tank project, we do need the uh, inspector to travel to uh, part of California and to Tucson to do some uh, special inspections of the material as it's being produced. Then once it gets to the site, uh, as they assemble it, there's some certain inspections that he needs to do to certify that the tank is uh, safe for potable water. So this uh, is a uh, beyond our capabilities internally uh, to do this type of inspection. Uh, so that's why we need this additional contract. Questions, comments from the council? Any from the public? Do you have a motion? Mayor, I move to approve city contract number 2017-353. Second. Motion and second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Item F. Thank you. Item F, adoption of resolution 4394-1603, approving an intergovernmental agreement, city contract 2017-365 with the state of Arizona through its Department of Transportation for design for the SR69 widening. Project between Prescott Lakes Parkway and Yavapai Prescott Indian Tribe Reservation Boundary. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council, Henry Hash, Public Works. Uh, this issue has been before you for several months, actually, over a year right now. And uh, the reason it's been taking so long because it's an intergovernmental uh, agreement between uh, several agencies, the city of Prescott, uh, the, the county, mm, ADOT, and SIMPO. Uh, finally, we all have reached an agreement, and the agreement is really based on the direction you gave us when we brought this before you last year. So at this point, we are ready to go ahead. Yeah. Any questions, comments from the council? Yes, Mr. Mayor, I'd just like to um, say thank you to um, John Palladini and his staff for getting on top of this pretty last minute, last week on some issues that were brought forward from SIMPO and the county. So appreciate it, John, and uh, please let your staff know. And so. I think we're ready to go. Hopefully now we get this in the five-year plan for ADOT. It's really important. So we need to sign off on this and the county needs to sign off? Yeah, well, yes, and it's gonna, I think it's on the agenda tomorrow for the county. And uh, SIMPO is, as soon as that's all done, we're ready to go, yeah. Okay, good. Any other questions, comments from the council? Any from the public? Good afternoon, it's Daniel Matson again. Um, when this first came forward some years ago, and I mean, I've missed a bunch of meetings for a while. You guys all, I think you've heard why. But anyway, they were talking about it putting a roundabout in the middle of this. Uh, well, they did the fruit when they first <laughs> brought it up uh, on that hill. I might you assume that they've realized that this is a really bad idea and they've taken it out? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> do, you, do you remember that? They wanted to put a roundabout oh to nowhere for access to the road on both sides in the middle of that hill, which would have been a real interesting during the winter. Okay, I'm all for it if there's no roundabout in it. Thumbs up. Any other public comment? I just would like to thank Councilwoman Or. She's really been very active here, as not only as a council, but a, a member of uh, SIMPO and former council member. Chris Cookney was quite involved in all of that, so I want to thank you for that. Well, thank you. Um, do I have a motion? Mayor, I move to uh, approve resolution 4394-1603. Second. Motion, second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Next item. Item G, approval of city contract number 2017-092A1, amending the original contract with the Sidwell Company for a sale of land management implementation services in the amount of $50,000. So. <laughs> I would be glad to talk about this. Nate, did you want to come talk about this one? Yeah, that'd probably be good. <laughs> To man a few words. Uh, 
uh, Mayor Council. I was under the impression Public Works was going to talk about this, but I can do it, no problem. Uh, the original Sidwell software implementation, which Sidwell is just an agent for a seller, a reseller. The way a seller does things is they pick a reseller that matches your needs. That reseller works with you to implement their software. The original scope of the contract with Acela slash Sidwell uh, is a best guess with software. There's certain known unknowns and known unknowns, that sort of thing. What this represents is some additional items that came up during the work on the project. And the uh, item today for your consideration is to fill in some gaps for things that weren't identified or more complicated than we initially thought they might be uh, and so forth. So I, I'd be more than happy to take any of your questions on that. So this is just additional software? More so additional business processes. Okay. So it's the same software. It's more making it do what it needs to do to so meet design our business. or something. Yeah, yeah exactly. Okay. Any questions, comments from the council? Any from the public? Do you have a motion? May I move to approve city contract number 2017-092A1? Second. Motion to second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mayor. Could I just, Nate? I just want to thank you for the work that you did on the on the directory. Oh, absolutely. It's, it's, it's truly excellent, far beyond the expectations. So that would be uh, Kenny you. Scott, our web developer, excellent. did all the hard work on that. Yeah. So thank you. Okay. Thank you. Next item. Item H, award of city contract number 2017-303 for the South Marina Street Pavement and Utility Upgrade Project to FAN con Contracting, Inc. in the amount of $1,747,716. Thank you. Um, this item is to award uh, the construction cro contract for the South Marina uh, Street Improvement Project, including some utilities. Uh, there's been a couple of presentations on this uh, project, uh, in what it includes, the streetscape, the pavement uh, uh, reconstruction, the storm drain, et cetera. Uh, the uh, project was publicly uh, noticed on two consecutive weeks in April. Uh, we did have a mandatory pre-bid meeting. Uh, we did receive uh, two bids in, on May 11th. We have completed our bid analysis and are recommending the award to fan contracting. If there's any other questions, we'd be glad to answer them. Councilwoman Wilcox. <clears throat> A question about the uh, timing of the notice to proceed. Yes. Um, it says in our materials project schedule, the construction is to commence the week of August 1st. Correct. I think we're still in pretty heavy tourist season there. And I know we've received some uh, written concerns from the downtown business owners about the tie up in traffic. Is there a possibility that we could push back the uh, time of construction? And uh, how would that affect and construction's sure. schedule? Uh, yes, we have seen those uh, written concerns. They were also expressed at our community meeting that we held recently. Uh, we have also uh, researched with our Recreation Services uh, Director Joe Baines, and based on his uh, indication that while it is still a busy time, it's not as busy as it is between now and August 1st. Uh, a lot of the uh, construction co uh, contract was written that at the end of the day, the trenches are backfilled. Everything is uh, put back to the way it kind of looks today, slightly better. Uh, and then the, uh, the first part of the project has the utilities, which are all subsurface, which don't impact the flow of traffic when it's not under active construction during the day, so that on the weekends, evenings, it's normal as it is right now. When the paving uh, and the concrete work starts is later into September, about a month or so after the construction starts, so there's not as much activity in the downtown at that point in time. So we feel that we can meet the needs of the tourism, which is very important, very paramount in the success of the city, and 
finishing before Thanksgiving, getting the asphalt in the ground, getting the concrete in the ground before the temperatures start to change, going the other direction. So we're kind of in this short window of time. Uh, we looked at you know, doing it in the spring again, but again, starting uh, a project when there's uh, underground moisture can lead to some challenges, especially in the downtown area where there's a lot of drainage uh, issues right now that we're attempting to address with these various projects that we're bringing forward. So we felt that this was the best window of time to get the project completed. We did put uh, restrictions into the contract that are of an over and beyond what we normally do for construction to make sure we address uh, those business concerns. So what provisions will be made to allow traffic to go through temporarily? Well, the road won't be closed. There may be certain times when the road is closed for a block while they're doing some work that uh, doesn't allow traffic to pass, but that's a short time during the, the day. Uh, when they're not working, it's open as it is right now. Uh, when it does get to that part of time where there's certain uh, pavement removals and the, and the road is just a subgrader base, uh, people will be able to pass. Uh, we do work with the contractor to make sure that the road is passable. Uh, there will be short times where, you know, portions of Union may be closed. Uh, there, uh, there won't be a time when Gurley is closed. We made that very clear last time we spoke on the project. Uh, also, before we can get into the Gurley intersection, the contract says that the rest of uh, Marina Street needs to be com basically completed with the initial lift of asphalt. So we've tried to incorporate many of these conditions into the specifications to make sure we have as minimal impact as we can on the uh, downtown. Has all of that been explained to the downtown business owners? <coughs> yes, okay. several times. You've seen the petition that was presented. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, I believe that I had a discussion with the city manager that before this happens that the downtown um, participants, meaning the businesses and churches and things, conduct their day to days. You, uh, you'll go down there and I'll be and glad to have a their conversation. Concerns. And um, I might also ask Mike Fan to participate in going door to door if he'd like to yeah, do that. Door to door. <laughs> he seems okay with it. I can tell from here. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions, comments on the council? Any from the public? <clears throat> Mayor, members of the council, my name is Pete Thompson. I come here as the vice president of asphalt paving and supply. Um, earlier today, I emailed a letter to the city manager objecting to the public works award recommendation for this project. <coughs> um, I award, uh, I apologize for the timing of this letter, but the website was apparently down and we didn't find out about this award recommendation until last night. <coughs> We were not notified by the Public Works Director or the Public Works Department and we were not given an opportunity to answer any questions about our bid. Because my speaking time is limited, I will only read a few paragraphs of my letter, letter and we respectfully ask that the Council review the entire letter before making any decisions. We just reviewed the June 27, 2017 City Council Agenda and corresponding Council Agenda Memo. I'm writing to object to the recommendation that the city awards city contract number 2017-303 to fan contracting in the amount of 1.747, excuse me, $1,747,716. Asphalt Paving and Supply submitted a bid of $1,491,216. Fan's bid exceeds the engineer's estimate and is $256,500 or 17.2% 17 higher than our bid. An award to found contracting will harm our business and impose excessive unnecessary costs on city taxpayers. For the reasons detailed below, we respectfully request that the city award city contract number 2017-303 to asphalt paving and supply at today's city council meeting. The city is not prepared to, if the city is not prepared to do so, the award decision must be tabled so we can participate in a pre-award conference in accordance with established city policy. Mm -hmm. 
As explained in my letter, the only issue with our bid was our error. We calculated our cost for the five inch paving item in square yards instead of tons. We bid $28 per ton when we should have bid around $95.95 per ton. So our total bid for that item was $35,980 instead of $123,295. It was our error and we are willing to honor our bid. This error didn't affect any other bid items and we didn't intentionally unbalance our bid. We are the only party harmed by the bid and we will lose money on the item and the city will save the money as well as the taxpayers. I'll again read a couple of short excer excerpts from my letter. The city can and should award to asphalt paving and supply. The city's evaluation of responsiveness is based on the incorrect assertion that per the city's contract documents, a bid cannot be deemed responsive it is, if it is mathematically unbalanced. You can look at the council agenda memo for that information. To the contrary, MAG specification 102.7 and the city's contract documents expressly state that proposals will be considered irregular and may be rejected for the following reasons. F, if the bid is mathematically unbalanced and G, if the bid is materially unbalanced. A letter from Stephen O'Rose dated August 24th, 2015 stated that there is no prohibition per se against a contractor submitting a mathematically unbalanced bid. The city has not followed its own policies. Here's a quote from Stephen O'Rose's letter dated August 24th, 2015 on a different project. The city's policy regarding the disposition of potentially unbalanced bids is to conduct a thorough review and conduct a pre-award conference with the apparent low bidder. The city does have a definition of what an unbalanced bid is and a reference to MAG section 102.7 regarding irregular bids. The city does have a procedure to review bids with prospective contractors to discuss items that do not appear to represent our understanding of the bid item. There is no prohibition per se against a contractor submitting a mathematically unbalanced bid. Both the projects in question were awarded to the low bidder whose bid was in question. The city should not reject our bid without following city policy by conducting a pre-award conference in good faith. If the city is not in a position to award asphalt paving and supply, the decision should be tabled. Thank you. Because we need some uh, understanding of what to do here. Do we have a specific question or? Well, I mean, uh, he's indicated that we're violating city policy. Are we violating city policy? Well, I don't believe it's city policy. Maybe Steve, you know, in terms of our engineering. And the pre-award. And, and our engineering standards, I, I defer to the, the public works department on the, our, um, or recently approved engineering standards from July last year. From July, so July 2016. The, the pre-award conference is something that we may do with uh, contractors uh, on a uh, project. Uh, that's what's stated in our contract documents, uh, and we sometime we we can just discuss a variety of things, or we can uh, skip over that optional task. May I ask a question of Mr. Rose? You can, you can ask it to be, yeah, and then he'll answer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if this is a practice that has been going on in the past with other contractors, why weren't we afforded that opportunity? The two hundred and fifty-six thousand dollars that the city is going to save by this. There were no other items that were artificially elevated to increase our costs. We're willing to eat that money. Um, we're going to honor our bid. Why weren't we afforded the opportunity that every other contractor has been afforded to? Or I, I can't say that. Every, the other contractors in question were afforded to explain their bid. Go ahead. You have an answer? <coughs> the uh, couple of uh, items that you brought up were related to uh, uh, unbalanced items that we've identified. Uh, when a item is a major item, like asphalt for a roadway project, that's a major item. So in our opinion, we felt that that was 
unbalanced and uh, went with the other bid. On the other references that uh, Asphalt Paving and Supply has referenced were fairly minor items, both in terms of dollar and process. Uh, we did speak with that contractor, and based on the contractor's uh, means and methods, we felt that those items were adequate, and that's why we recommended award, and the council did award uh, based on a recommendation on those other projects. So basically, uh, if I understand you correctly, we're not violating any of our policies that we've had in the past. Not that I know of. Okay. Thank you. Any other public comment? Okay, do I have a motion? Mayor, let me make sure I have the right one. Excuse me, here I am. Move to award city contract number 2017-303. Second. Okay, a motion second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Thank you. <coughs> Next item. Just for the record, I think since Councilman Blair's not here, unless he gave Councilman Shishke his proxy, it should be rec recorded as six to zero with Blair absent. It showed up as it showed up as Blair voting. Blair Blair Ghost Project. Okay. So we'll just have yeah, we got this right now. So is it gonna be a proxy? It should be, no, it's six to zero with Blair Blair is Blair absent. absent. Okay. Yeah. Um, item, item I, public hearing for the t FY 2018 budget expenditure limitation and tax levies at special meeting adoption of resolution 4393-1602, adopting the final FY 2018 budget expenditure limitation and city job roster. Thank you, Virgie. Uh, Mark Woodfellow, Budget and Finance Director, Mayor and Council. Uh, this is obviously the public hearing for the budget, so I don't want to talk too much, but I want to kind of go over the process to date. Uh, up on the board, I have the list of public meetings we've had on the budget this year. If you do a rough estimate, it's about 25 hours of public meetings we've had on various aspects of this budget. Obviously, beyond that, there's thousands of hours of city staff time that has gone into this. Through the process, uh, we identified a lot of a lot of things. We had a lot of good discussion, and as far as the final uh, couple budget workshops, uh, council expressed a real desire to have input into the streets projects, prioritization, and that type of stuff. So we will be bringing forward in the next 90 days, early in the next budget cycle, even part of this budget cycle, if you will. Public Works will bring back a, a, a workshop to discuss those projects and have that discussion and direction from council so that they can prioritize their things per council's direction. So, thank you, Mayor. Mark, so approving this budget, we're just earmarking those projects and they could or could not happen, but we just need to approve those. We're, yes, ad ad adopting the budget allocates budget appropriation to the various funds to allow uh, things to continue into the new year. I think Public Works obviously financed it and City Manager heard that Council wants to have input into the priorities and the, and the timing of those streets right. projects. So that will be coming forward as soon as Public Works can put that together to um, have that discussion. I just want to make it clear that it's still in motion, but we're just approving that money right now. Correct, yeah. appropriation. Um, the steps that we're talking about to finish up the 2018 budget is today our public hearing on the budget, the property tax levy, and the alternative expenditure limitation. Uh, as Virginia mentioned, we will have a special meeting right after this one where council will actually consider a resolution that adopts those things as well as the roster. Um, then on the 11th of July, the uh, property tax levy that is contemplated in this budget that we have discussed will be coming back for council consideration. So the resolution, as I said, adopts those things. It sets the home rule alternative limit at 188,853,251. Adopts the roster with the full-time positions, which is in your packet. As you can see, we're down to 494. 
for fiscal year 18, which has been going down each of the last three years, each of the last eight years, actually, if you look at the whole trend of it quite significantly. Um, in the packet, based on council discussion of the last thing, we give you two options for council consideration. This, of course, is the tentative budget as adopted, which had an $84 million capital budget, which was a 14% increase, and had the $9.7 million contingency budget, which, of course, was related to Proposition 443 and a few other um, things that we have already discussed. Option two was to stretch out those capital works budgets between 18 and 19 and move that freed up appropriation to contingency to allow council to make a direction during the year whether to use that for advanced payments to PSPRS or to allocate to capital projects that actually are proceeding as public works of fields they may. Anyway, it moves it out of the capital gives the appropriation, allowing council that option um, later in the year to, to move that around. Again, leaving the total budget at 188, 8, And the movement's about $11 million? $11 million, yes. So Mark, Mark, I'm sorry. We're approving the 188, 853? You're approving either option one or option two. Okay. Uh, the council does need to make direction on this because it does affect the actual budget schedules that are adopted with resolution 4393-1602. There are two different sets of schedules in your agenda packet, so the, the motion would have to be specific as to which option you want to include with that resolution. Okay, I got a couple questions here. Councilwoman Wilcox. Hey Mark, just so I understand, uh, on option two, um, we're moving that would move from public works capital general fund but if public works capital is funded with the streets fund aren't we taking it from the streets fund silo and putting it into the general fund i thought we couldn't do that as as discussed in the memo councilwoman wilcox it's a good question to make sure i make it clear to the public and everybody um, this is movement of budget appropriation this is not movement of cash between those funds. So by moving it into the contingency, if council decided to leave it there and to allocate it to a PSPRS uh, additional payment next year, those appropriation would be used in the general fund, but the cash would come from the reserves in the general fund, not touching the utilities or the streets um, cash. It is, again, a budget appropriation that you adopt with this, not actual the cash. Okay, thank you for explaining that. Yeah. Mayor Brockdale. Thanks, Mayor. Um, similar to the question Lazelle asked a little bit ago, this is a, is, is a cap. We can't spend over it. Um, I have several questions. Number one, last year, what did we spend? What did we actually spend? Remember? Uh, it's projected. Now, what did we project? What did we spend? Well, the year's not over, Councilman, so I, I can come I back in a month that. or two and tell you, but I can give you a projection today that we project it to be about a hundred and fourteen million. That's what we project on spending. That's this year. Correct. Okay, now last year, which was my question, we planned on spending a whole bunch of money and we didn't spend it. Correct. So we have a track record of telling the public we plan on spending a whole bunch of money and then we don't spend it. And a lot of that planned on we're going to spend it is in capital projects that we know we're not going to get done in two, three, four, five years anyway. Um, I have some reservations about budgeting this kind of way because effectively what we're doing is we're setting money right up to spend it regardless of what what takes place and then my other question is, is specifically in this projected budget did we have an line item budget to set aside a contribution to pay up the pension fund for PSPRS or is that one of those things that we're just kind of kicking around that maybe we will do it and maybe we won't do it and maybe we'll move a little bit of money here and move a little bit of money there to give us the flexibility of later on 
So we have appropriated by line item the regular payment for next year out well, of we the operating have to, we budget. Have to do, yeah, we and have. And we to have do that. included a contingency in this in case Proposition 443 passes. And based on your discussion at the council meeting two weeks ago, we have included moved that $11 million from capital to contingency so council can use that to make that decision that appropriation if they wish if you wish to do that as a legislative body in the new year so let me get clarification on that one one, one more time so we have to pay the mandate right correct Which is approximately six seven million dollars 7.8 I believe yeah all right if 443 passes that has to be put correct. on paying up PSPRS right correct and if we pass the tentative budget we would also have the liberty to contribute as much as 11 million correct correct on the top of the other all right so in actuality in one year's swoop how much opportunity in dollars would we have to paying up the pension fund <coughs> about 24.8 all right, I want to hear that loud and clear, and I want it on a public record. If Thank council you. directs, yes, sir. Councilwoman Orr. So that would be an annual. That would be next no, year. Just, oh, the, f the full year. Yes. Okay, the, f the full calendar year. Yes. Okay, very good. So option two is what gives us the flexibility to do this. Correct. Yes. So okay. Close just, to $25 million. Exactly. Perfect. Councilman Jessica. Thanks, Mayor. I think what the public needs to understand is FY17 budget was 167. We spent approximately 114. Um, what the public needs to understand is that we are not in any way taxing them to get up to the 167,000. We are spending 114,000 which is things that are Million. expedient for us to spend and so you know I, I guess from one standpoint we could say gee we only spent 114 and we budgeted 167 and look all the milk at all the money we saved you but that's not the way it works um, but also we are not getting revenue for the 167,000 million. million from the public 167 million correct the 167 and the 188 both have a revenue component for the revenues that are projected to come in but they also have a fund balance a use of fund balance yes. especially in the capital projects okay. which is very substantial so I probably confused everybody a lot but uh, thank you very much I appreciate that <laughs> But um, we, we are using the public's money expeditiously. Yes, sir. Thank you. Frugally. Um, Councilwoman Wilcox. Uh, Mark, I have a question about uh, the authorized position roster, page three of eight. Uh, at the last meeting we had on the tentative budget, I raised the question of whether or not we need an additional code compliance officer and I see that in the final budget it's still only one code compliance officer and correct and we have our code enforcement person here to address any questions you have specifically oh, okay. he's here Just to talk time. about his workload yeah I think that'd be appropriate okay is Mike in the audience Mike is, here. Mike is in the audience <laughs> and I put the section you're referring to up on the screen if you have any Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Mike Fleming, your sole cold compliance officer. How can I help you? <laughs> well, I guess I, my question is, and maybe some other me members of the Council have the same question. Um, do we need an additional cold compliance officer? Uh, my, my sole opinion is it all depends upon what you want in your city. What do you want your city to look like? Um, little history 
For the last year and a half, I've been your only code enforcement officer with the city of Prescott. Um, we, I take complaints gen generally o only based upon complaint. I don't go out and do proactive enforcement. All my workload comes from citizens of the town complaining about their neighbors, what they don't like, and then I go out and investigate and determine if there's a violation. Um, my workload it increases with the seasons. This time of year, especially with the fire, uh, everything's a fire hazard in town. So I, right now I'm, I'm juggling about 100 cases, plus I got about 12 complaints sitting in my inbox to investigate. So I keep pretty busy. Um, it will decrease a little bit in the winter time. You know, the snow comes and I don't get the weed complaints anymore, the dry brush. But uh, one person in a town this size, it's, it's, I stay busy. The question I have for the council is, is what kind of city do you want? I mean, if you want me to keep going the way I am, I can keep doing it. Uh, but my personal opinion is, there's a lot of things we could be doing a lot better. And we just don't have the staff to do it. Well, I would agree with you. I'd like to see a beautiful city polished and clean the way we said we were going to do. And live up to our word. Uh, right now, you're right. There are a lot of dry weeds uh, that are not being taken care of. And it's, it's a fire hazard all the way through to the next spring, in my opinion. Dilapidated properties. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I think we need to do a better job of uh, un unfortunately, too, it seems like we, some of the citizens really don't take the initiative to correct their property maintenance issues until they get a letter from the code enforcement telling them they're in violation. Um, I deal with the same people a lot of times over and over again. A lot of times the response is, well, I wait for it to get the letter from you guys before I hire someone to go you know, trim my lot or whatever. Uh, so it's a it's, it's con continuing cycle. Job security. It is. I'm tired though, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, a, a budgetary question maybe for Mark. Uh, if we approve either option one or two, is there any flexibility within that budget to add a, a code compliance officer? Should we see the need? Yeah, definitely, Councilwoman. Um, as we discussed, it, it is always up to the council throughout the year can move appropriation between department and they can add positions at any time the council wants to add positions. So if, if you know, we look at statistics in August or whenever and council decides that they want to add that position, they can add that position any time during the year. Councilman Lizelle. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mike, I got a question for you. Sure. So we, we double your efficiency. Is your workload still going to be big? I, I think we're still going to have a workload. I think what I would say if, we, if I had help is we could get to some of the other things that I just can't get to now. Uh, maybe a little more proactive. For instance, if I get a complaint in your neighborhood about someone complaining Never. about Never <laughs> about the weeds or the trash. I've already taken care of my neighbors. Well, some of them. <laughs> Very good, but there's our neighborhood, so we don't have that luxury. So, um, what I generally do is deal with that one, the violation that I've got to complain on. You know, verify that it is a true violation, and then deal with it. But on the way in that street, I might see three others. At this time, those three others just kind of, you know, the blinder goes on, and I go on to the next complaint. Uh, I think if I had the extra help. That'd be one of the things I'd mandate. You know, if you see one, you're there. Take care of the other two or three at the same time. Um, I'm going to ask you a question, and you can answer or not. If we sat you down with oh, our community development department and some other various other departments, and we went through some of our codes that we have, could you objectively look and say, you know what, you could you could have this code till the cows come home and nothing's ever going to be done or this is a moot code and we should you know basically clean up some of these things would, would you have some input on that sure absolutely okay thank you mayor pro tem thank you um <clears throat> here again um 
Mr. Manager, we've talked about this in the past with regards of prioritization and allocation of resources. In a town the size of Prescott, we've got six engineers and one code enforcement officer. Um, maybe we need a couple of more code enforcement officers and a few less engineers. Um, I don't know how to bring that up uh, other than the way I just did again. Um, you know, here again, it's, it's a matter of health and safety issues when you talk about codes and you talk about compliance and you talk about who you, can you subcontract out into the private sector to do certain jobs. We can contract out some of the engineering jobs as needed. But if you need code enforcement, 365, 24-7, I just don't understand the way we do this. Well, I think that that becomes a philosophical policy question for you guys. Do you want 365, 24-7 code enforcement? Because that's a dramatic change in service delivery based on what we have now. Maybe 365 is extreme, but how about maybe 100? How about maybe, you know, instead of 24-7, eight hours a day, or whatever the case would be. The point I'm trying to make is that does a town this size truly need six engineers and one code enforcement officer? Or do we need more code enforcement officers, less engineers, and contract as needed some of the engineering work out? When we're working with limited resources. Sure, it's all a prioritization, Mayor Pro Tem, and as we decide you know, how to fill the bodies that we have, we need to prioritize where we think we have unmet service delivery needs. And you know, Mike's saying that he could be more proactive if he had more bodies. I think that's fair to say. Well, I'm not sure that I've heard from you guys as a collective that you're ready to be more proactive. And if you are, that's probably going to take additional staff resources. But if you're not, then I think we can get by with what we have. I've heard Gene bang the drum to be proactive. I'm not sure the rest of you are there. And if you're not, I think we can get by where we are. And, and it goes back to what Lizelle said, though. Well, being proactive about what? Some of those codes that we have are so damn draconian, you can't even get to all of them. And the bottom line is, if you're going to have uh, enforcement on political signs, you're going to have enforcement on flags, you're going to have enfor what, what are we going to have enforcement on? Um, one of my big beefs has always been a clean and neat city like Jean's. And I complain about the gutters and the weeds and the sidewalks and all those. That's the first thing people see in this community. When they go to a restaurant, if they got cigarette butts and weeds growing all over the front of the restaurant, are you going to go in there and eat that restaurant? Probably not. So to me, I think code enforcement is important. But based upon what Greg said, I'd be willing to sit down as well and look at the codes and see what we want to be more proactive on, see what we want to address. And blight is one of those things, and it's huge. I think that's a good idea, Steve. Councilwoman Orr. Yeah, I, I like the idea uh, that Greg suggested in sitting down with Mike. You know, it does concern me, Mike, when I, when I hear you say, just because of your hours, that you drive by and you see something and you kind of have to go this way because you're going to, to that, to point C, it, so you have to overlook B that you know is, I guess my concern is safety. I've seen some pictures of some facilities and some buildings that look like they're about to fall down. And I think that is certainly a public safety issue. And if we're not able to get to public safety issues that are code violations, then I certainly think we, we need to be more proactive that way. Uh, are, are we seeking to look like Scottsdale? No, I don't, I, don't believe, I don't believe so. But I do think that we want to make sure that we're safe and if there are weeds growing and it's a fire hazard, that should be taken care of. If, if there's a, a building that's ready to fall down, then that, is, that needs to be stopped. So I, I guess, you know, how much we want to go, I think for, we need to set those standards. And then we look at those standards and say, all right, this is a problem. And I think we've, we've had pictures presented to us that are problems. 
and we I don't think we should be overlooking those. No, and I, I think Mark's point is good, and Jim brought it up. You're not by approving this today. You're not locking yourself into saying you're not going to add a body. Um, and maybe what we need to do, uh, forget maybe, we need to do it is obviously do a better analysis of where we are and yeah. what your expectations are as a collective. And, and let's get the codes off the book that should not be there, mm -hmm. but then let's enforce the ones that are. You know, why have a law if you can't enforce it? That's Councilman Lizell. Okay, take another whoop at this. Um, uh, Jim, I'm, I'm not dismissing anything you said. I just want to clarify something, though. We could get rid of the entire engineering department, but that's one bucket of money. Doesn't I want the, the public to be clear, because I don't want anybody to think that if we get rid of an engineer, we can hire a cop. Those are two separate types of buckets of money. So I just want to make that clear. It's general fund money, Greg. Um, one of the things I was bringing up, however, is because you have also codes that govern sidewalk conditions. You have codes that govern bicycle lane conditions. You have codes that govern street conditions. You have adjacent property owners to public sidewalk conditions. Blah, 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 blah. On and on they go. I agree with Greg. Get rid of the ones you can't enforce. Get rid of the ones you don't need. But on the other hand, look at the demographic of Prescott. Look at the age bracket of Prescott. Look at the mobility of the people and how many people walk. Look at the things that get ignored because we don't have the staff. And I agree with Greg from a, or Billy, one of you two, brought up public safety. Well, it's not safe when the public in the city of Prescott, where you have a high aged population, are subjected to walking on unshoveled sidewalks, riding their bicycles on filth, sand, wood laden bicycle lanes, except we everybody's hometown for bicycles too. Remember we won that award too. Everybody likes to come here and ride your bike. But guess who's responsible for those bicycle lanes? We are. We the taxpayers. And if we do not adhere to that and somebody falls in a pothole like what has happened in this town before, guess who paid the price? We the taxpayer. Councilman Blair. Yeah, I'm not going to take a bite at the apple, but I, I would say sometimes we, the city of Prescott, are our own worst enemies because we have a lot of properties and a lot of trails that have trees and everything else that aren't maintained. And so I would suggest that we need to look at our own backyard as well. Um, and that's an assessment by our code people that we need to have him working for us as well, telling our people that we have some public safety issues on our own properties. Well, we used to have two code enforcement folks. What's changed when when it's down to one? Are, are we getting around doing less? Because what I understand was that uh, when you had two, that were handling about the same amount of work. Is that correct or not? No, that's that's not correct. I actually had um, stats pulled for years when we had uh, more code enforcement officers. Um, Going back to July of 2014 through June of 2015, uh, under two officers working in the department, we had uh, 1,221 cases that we opened that year. Uh, we ended up closing 1,047 cases that year that we got to completion where we got the people to comply with the code or we took the next step to the legal process. Uh, then going into uh, 2016 to 2017, uh, the it's been significant, right around 500 cases open projected and um, 415 closed. So there has been other increases with the workload as far as uh, dealing with vacation rentals and, and sober living homes, uh, but you, Mayor, you can't do more with less. You, the reality is you do less with less. Yeah, and I am concerned about uh, the sober living homes, whether or not we're having the time that we really need to do the inspections on that and the code, code compliance. Um, I think that's very important. I think we're going to have a meeting coming up in, in July, and I know that the ad hoc committee is going to be looking at that pretty closely. Um, again, you know, I, I think the city manager indicated that one of his intents is to to have some eyes out there. Uh, yeah. Maybe you can go ahead and explain that. Yeah, I think I, you know, that one of the ideas behind 
putting Mike and his uh, functions under community development was we have a lot of people in the community development department, specifically the building inspectors, who are out on the road. And if part of it is the idea of trying to be, the term proactive can be misused. Proactive to me means like you go around and you identify every problem in the world and you go to the extreme. And that's not really what we're talking about. What we're saying is not to ignore pr like problems on same streets because it, there's some inequity with that, right? So. I think that, and Tom would agree to this, that our, our building inspectors could be the eyes and ears and identify some of these like problems and report them back to Mike and help be his eyes and ears. I, I don't know that that's a, a, a complete solution, but it certainly would assist him with some of the time issues he's dealing with. I, I think I've heard from everybody up here that he needs help. That's what I've heard. Yeah. Councilwoman Orr. Yeah, and, and I, I would agree. And I would also say that I, I think there's an education piece to this. There is. And there's an outreach piece to this as far as th these are the expectations. And, you know, we can put that in our water bill. We can do however we want to communicate. And there's, you guys have heard, <coughs> excuse me, heard me tell the story. I grew up on the wrong side of town in a little southern town. and um, But that community took, that we took care of our neighborhoods and, and and it was beautiful and with very little money because we wanted our little community to be to be pretty and beautiful and and I think there's a certain pride that we need to also let neighborhoods take I don't think we go down mm -mm. we don't go on top of I think we we do as much as we can and and let neighborhoods say well let's stand back and see what this street looks like what can we do as a community that little community to make this prettier and but if there's something that's unsafe and we're ignoring it because we don't have the staff that that really needs well, to I hope we're not talking about unsafe conditions I, I, we're not I don't know I've seen some pictures that of buildings I, that I just mean like when Mike was referencing ignoring things I, I can't imagine okay. that that's what you were talking about so no, and, okay. and, and Councilwoman um, if there is a situation where I really believe it's an unsafe structure I get Randy and, and his people involved in that okay. yeah Mike, it's just not unsafe structures. It's unplowed, unshoveled sidewalks with six inches of snow on them all packed down from people walking. That, yeah. What an exposure to this community that is for a broken leg because we didn't do what we're supposed to do. Okay, um, the big thing is, and I think uh, Mark indicated, is that we have the flexibility in the future with the authorization uh, that we proved today to uh, do the analysis, I think, needs to be done yeah. to, to see exactly where we stand and, and what it, we need in a way because I know we we gave uh, uh, a full-time position we did we, we gave him some um, administrative assistance support which I think has been extremely helpful I don't want to put words in Mike's mouth but I think I am <laughs> and it, ha it has been from a customer service perspective because when I'm out and about you know my phone would ring and then I come back and have 20 messages to try to return phone calls to that's not the case anymore I have someone actually answer the phone and talk to people hit the complaints not all the complaints that I get over the phone are actually code enforcement complaints sometimes it's information for a building official sometimes it might be for uh, property drainage it might go to engineering so we can also at that time divert them to the right person in the city to help them with their problem or their question so from that perspective plus it also helps me with my workload the paperwork workload the letters that have to go out because my admin takes care of that for me okay do you have anything else mark before we go to the public no nope. okay do i have any public comment on the budget as it stands right now Good afternoon, Council. I'm Connie Can Tell Me. Can I offer a suggest suggestion on the code enforcement? I'm going to offer a suggestion and an opinion. Can I pass this around to everybody? Is, this all, is that all right? I've just handed out to you are 
literally in a one, no, two blocks from the square. They're in a street right behind the street I live on. Um, I sent these pictures, many of these pictures, in a packet to you about a year ago. Um, it's, it's disturbing to me because if we, if we can only have one code enforcement officer, we have bigger issues than weeds. The weeds are bad, I agree with you, but you can look at those pictures there. And some of those properties actually are a safety hazard. There's a, I'm a general contractor by trade. Um, I understand about how building structures go. The one that is almost tipping over is actually a hazard, it's a safety hazard. The man that supposedly lived in that lived in the trailer next door because the house was so unsafe. Uh, so, you know, as it, as it concerns our, our property values and our, in our street and our neighbors, that shouldn't have been allowed to get to that, that disrepair. I mean, if we had code enforcement years ago, I don't think that would have gotten that bad. So anyway, that was one of the things. Um, let's talk about the correlation between that kind of thing and our economic development, which we're trying really, really hard right now to build up the economic development. Think about it, if you're a business owner and you w drive down that street, would you want to invest your money? I've been saying that. Look at those roads. That road right there starts at Mount Vernon and goes all the way down to um, Penn. We, we got that approved through the budget two and a half years ago. We're still sitting there with no action on that road. These are important parts of our economic development. People want to come here. They want to live downtown. We have no product to give them. They're not going to buy one of those houses that look like that. Most people don't do that. I do that, but I'm in the trades. It's easy for me to fix that up and, and make some money on it even. But the thing is, that is not the product that the people coming here to this city to put their money in for business that's not what they want. We've got to do something about that. So if we can't put another code enforcement person on staff, we really need to prioritize what we do. Uh, again, those houses need to be looked at. There's so many non-compliance issues with those houses, it should have never gotten to that state. If they had been years ago being made to keep up with the ordinances, it wouldn't have gotten to that state. But many of them, I've had Mike even say to me, well, those people can't afford to fix that up. Well, no, they can't now. It's been let go for years and years and years. Those are cancers on our streets, in our neighborhoods. And it's not fair to the rest of us. I know everybody here has said, well, they have property rights too. Well, they do, but that's the minority. What about the majority of us that have come into the city, dumped our money into this city, and we're looking to the city to do, the, do their job? That blight ordinance, when you say you're gonna remove some things out of there because you can't enforce them, if you remove that blight ordinance, that's a cop-out. We have really got to be proactive and protect our city. Again, if it, you're not going to do it because of the property rights, do it for the other people that are bringing their money into the city, looking for economic development, want to live downtown, and want an agreement and a promise from the city council to do the right thing for them. These are the taxpayers. So I think we have a duty to do what we said we're going to do, what's in that ordinance, and what we've promised those taxpayers to do, and we haven't done it for years. Anyway, that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. But please consider, if you're not going to get a second code enforcement, at least have him prioritize what's really important. And you can see the blighted conditions. And that, again, is just one street down here, a, couple, a block away from uh, Mount Vernon. And you know, Mount Vernon is a beautiful, beautiful street. We can do that. We can have a lot of Mount Vernons. We just have to have a proactive city. Thank you. I have to say something, Mayor, if I could. Um, Connie, I agree with you. There are blighted conditions here and maybe some of them do need to be addressed. But Pleasant Street was all blighted. You know yeah, what, you know I was what, a part of redoing that. I've done three homes on that street. And I know somebody has done almost 10. You know what mm -hmm. it took? It took them to invest in it. And yeah. it took Mount Vernon to spill over there yeah. and somebody to come in and invest with their money to do it. Greg, you're talking to the queen of that. Listen, I have done nine projects down here, literally with no help. I've self-funded them. And you know I've been begging the council for years to do their job. And that is cut him loose, let him start putting fines out there to these people. That's unacceptable. And you know, the bigger picture is how this is the correlation between economic development but and you're this missing, You're missing my point. Pleasant and, and the cancer was eradicated by the free market and property rights, people yeah. coming in and investing their money. That's right. That's my point. I agree with you. But that street right there is Virginia, and nobody will touch that street. I was street. actually looking at one of these houses to buy. Yeah, to good. Them. Yeah, there's three on the market right with, now. With my money, not the city's. Well, would you hurry up and do that? <laughs> I'm kidding. Well, I, I can't sit here and not say anything. I can look at the other end of Virginia and look at Bill Feldmeyer who's taking a bunch of those houses. Mm. Yeah. It's private money. He did that himself. Yeah. And I, I, you know, this house here, 
I had one just like that next to my house. You know, if that's the way they choose to live, that's the way they choose to live. I'm not going to be a, a regulator of somebody's life. Well, then you probably do need to remove the blight ordinance because it's there, and that is a promise to the taxpayers that the city is of what the city will do for them. This is a blight only in your eyes and not the people that live there. There's nobody that lives there, by the way. That's an abandoned home. Well, if it's abandoned, it still doesn't look too bad. Okay, thanks. Thank Any other uh, public comment? Good afternoon, Mayor, Council, Sandra Smith, 701 Whites Bar. Um, two things. I think leaving the money that we can put it toward PSPRS is a very good idea because that thing's got to go away. That even made Discus in a discussion. Discus is international. <laughs> so we're on the map with that, the whole, the whole mess. People had the wrong idea about what was going on about it even. Um, the other thing is with the code enforcement, Mike, there are a lot of people like me who are out on the streets at ground level basically. We could be your eyes and ears too looking for code violations if we knew what the codes are exactly. If we could sit down with you and be volunteers like your citizens on patrol for the police department, maybe we could knock on a door and ask somebody to comply with the code and then if they don't want to do it, report it to you so that you could go further actions. It's not official, but yet it might get their attention. That's just one suggestion. That would be a saving for the city, a help for you, and an improvement to the city as well. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any further comment? Do you have a motion? And may I recommend to move to close public hearing? I think maybe one more gentleman who has a comment. Oh. Oh. There we go. Mayor and Council, nice to see you today. It's getting to be a long day. Yeah. Can you identify yourself yeah. and give your address? Uh, my concern basically is the money that's can, being can spent. Can you give us your name and address? The, the money that we've spent on Alarkin Street. No, yeah. can you can you give your name and address? Oh, Campbell W. Smith. Record, yeah. I live in Stringfield Road, have business here, you have a pie block. <coughs> and have been in business here since 53, so the family has been in business a long time. I think that we've actually overdone the situation on Alarkin Street. And I think before you proceed, uh, you've got two projects, one with just bid and taken care of, uh, the other one is under process and, w and uh, will be completed. Uh, I really think before you go any further that you should get total input from the neighborhoods in those areas over the next year, year and a half, so that you really know how those uh, uh, neighborhoods are affected. To me, I'm quite shocked with it. Uh, to me, uh, Prescott is a very desirable place and one of the reasons is, is because we have wide streets and plenty of room. There's a lot of communities that do not have that and I don't like to see that destroyed. Uh, I used to go to the Congregational Church years ago and had donated the pavers that were in the medium area where you between the curb and the sidewalk those were removed and uh, the whole nine yards over there is very expensive and we have a lot of things here on the road side of it that aren't being done and I think those things need to be done. The crosswalk situation in this town is, is pretty dangerous. Uh, I think all of us have probably had times when we nearly hit somebody. They basically are either riding bikes or walking. They're also uh, dressed in dark in the evening. You can't see them. And uh, it's just a matter of time. You know, we've hit some and killed some already, but that number will go up. And a lot of people don't pay attention to what the cars are doing. So I do think that uh, keeping the roadways open uh, for drainage, snow removal, and those kind of things are very important. Okay, thank you much. Okay, I guess if there's no further um, public comment, do I have a motion? Move to close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion and second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Okay, we'll adjourn that meeting and uh, start our next meeting.
Tuesday, June 27, 2017. This is a special meeting of the Prescott City Council. Roll call, please. Mayor Oberg? Here. Mayor Pro Tem Lamerson? Here. Councilman Blair? Yes. Councilman Lazelle? Here. Councilwoman Orr? Here. Councilman Shiska? Here. Councilwoman Wilcox? Here. All present? Okay, item 3A. Item 3A, public hearing for the FY 2018 expenditure limitation and tax levies at special meeting adoption of the resolution 4393-1602 adopting the final FY 2018 budget expenditure limitation and city job roster. Mayor and Council, no real further comments. Again, it just adopts the budget. Um, the Council who will need to adopt option A or option one or option two, and uh, it also adopts a roster that we discussed. Sure. Yes, I'll start the discussion. I, I really uh, would like to, to put my support behind option two so that we have the flexibility uh, and, we, and we show the commitment. We've, we've said it a gazillion times up here in the dais, but that it's very plain and clear that it is our desire of this council to pay down this unfunded liability as soon as possible. The sooner we pay it, the less we pay in the long run. And, and I just think that is our commitment and that we need to get this to a manageable level and keep it in our crosshairs from here on out. Mayor Pro Tem. Thank you. Um, Mark, one more time. It's not cut in stone. It's something we can change. What you can't change is the max. You don't have to spend the max. You can rotate the dollars. What you can't do is spend more. So what we're doing is putting a cap. And we do have flexibility within that cap. Correct, sir. That Yes, we are establishing the maximum budget appropriation. As you know, all the items for contracts and other things come back to the council for award as we do every Tuesday. And um, the contingency is available for council to allocate to whatever um, the PSPRS uh, that they wish to. And I, and I understand that. I just want to keep getting that same thing on the book over and over. So folks need to understand we're not agreeing to spend $168 million today. We're agreeing not to spend more than. Correct. And, the, and anything that's in there is flexible. Yes, sir. All right. Councilwoman Wilcox. Uh, Mark, a decision of the council to pay an additional amount to PSPRS would require future action, correct? Yes, it would. Councilman Shiska. Thanks, Mayor. <laughs> I agree with Billy. I think that it's imperative that we vote for uh, option two. I think it's it's time that the public understands that this council, we can't uh, obligate future councils, but this council is bound and determined to pay down our PSPRS unfunded liability as soon as possible. You know the questions, comments from the council? Do you have a motion? Mayor, I move to adopt resolution number 4393-1602 with option two, budget schedules. Second. We have a motion to second vote, please. Passes unanimously. Okay, thank you. Um, i give you my final uh, founding father's comment from Patrick Henry. Bad men cannot make good citizens. A defective state of morals, a corrupted public conscience, are incompatible with freedom. Thank you for coming. This means adjourned. I thought you could come up with something.